بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. We ask Allah to increase our knowledge and benefit us with the knowledge we have acquired. Ameen. We are still explaining the obligatory knowledge upon every accountable person and we have reached the section about the sins of the abdomen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادِ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا Allah mentioned in this verse that one will be questioned on the day for judgment about his hearing, about his sight, and about his heart. However, what is mentioned in this verse is not for restriction. So it means not only the person will be questioned about his hearing, sight, and heart, Rather, one will be questioned about the other organs as well. How did you use your eyes? How did you use your ears? How did you use your tongue? And you'll be questioned about the other parts of your body. That's why one needs to know about the sins of every organ so he can stay away from them. We'll talk about the sins of the abdomen, meaning what you cannot consume into your stomach. That will be classified from the sins of the abdomen. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that every flesh that is nurtured from haram, then hellfire is more deserving of it. Every body that is nurtured from haram, then hellfire is more deserving of it. That's why you find in the previous eras, the previous centuries, some righteous Muslims who had a level of God-fearingness that is very, very, very high to the extent that they don't only avoid what is haram, they avoid what is halal if they have the slightest suspicions about it. So if they are suspicious about the source of this halal, they would avoid it. These days, you find many people careless. They are not even interested in knowing from where this food has come, from halal or haram, the money, where it is from halal or haram. As the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that a time will come on this nation where people are keen to collect money without giving any regard whether they are collecting from halal or haram sources. So same you need to be sure that what you consume into your body is from halal. What you take into your body cavity from your mouth, the food that you are eating, the drink that you are drinking is from halal. Do not let haram go into your body. That's why one needs to know about the sins of the abdomen. Among the sins of the abdomen is to consume the money of usurious gain. We explained before that to benefit from what has come from a usurious gain transaction, 
that's called the riba transaction whether it is food that one is consuming or other than that is unlawful haram the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the hadith damned the one who takes the riba the one who gives it to the taker and the one who writes down the contract of riba and the witnesses on the contract of riba that's why one needs to be cautious not to be involved in any transaction that involves riba in it riba is a major sin that's called the usurious gain every debt that generates a profit either to both or to one of them this is classified as riba and it could be in different forms and scenarios but that's the rule that every debt that generates a benefit either to both or to one of them is classified as riba it doesn't have to be an increase increment in money upon return it could be something else so a person may say to a person i'll lend you let us say 1000 you return them 1000 by the end of the year however you let me use your car for free that is riba because this debt he lent him the money and he put a condition and in that condition he is generating a benefit to himself that is classified as riba so it doesn't have to be an increment in money upon returning the debt so any kind of benefit that is generated because of that transaction lending money is classified as riba so to consume the money of the usurious gain is from the uh, sins of the abdomen also to consume the money of others taken from them by force and that is called al ghasab or to consume the money taken from others through stealing that is to take the money of others stealthily that's called the stealing islamically stealing has that definition something is kept in a place where such items are usually kept to preserve them for safekeeping where do you put such an item then someone would sneak into this house let us say and take the item from that place where such an item is usually kept for safekeeping that is called stealing but if someone let us say found something on on the road and he took it he is not allowed he needs to identify it for one year uh, he cannot take it and just let us say he found money he cannot just take it and go spend it but that is not called stealing he took they they call this luqata it has certain rules in our religion so the lost and found items they have specific rules in our religion if he wants to take them he needs to identify them for one year to find the owner of such lost item but this is not called stealing so there is a difference in definition because stealing like the one let us say went into a house he found a box and he broke that box he found jewelry in it and he took the jewelry this is called stealing because he took the uh, jewelry from the place where they are usually kept for safekeeping this is classified as stealing anyway any money taken from others unjustly whether by force whether through stealing or any other forbidden way is classified as haram but these are different definitions for them also to consume anything taken through a deal unlawful by the islamic law that is classified as haram so even sometimes let us say you found a bottle of alcohol let us say 
you don't drink alcohol, but you chose to sell it, you cannot sell it. That transaction is invalid and it's haram to sell it to someone who would drink it. So if you sell him this bottle of alcohol and you take the money, this money is taken unjustly through an unlawful transaction. Then it's haram for you to benefit with this money. Also to consume alcohol, any intoxicating drink that alters the state of mind and causes ecstasy, they call this khamr in Arabic, alcohol. So any kind of drink that is intoxicating, could be different brands, different types, any drink that will cause intoxication, it alters the state of mind, it causes ecstasy, this is classified as forbidden. If, let us say, you have grapes, if you squeeze the grapes, you put them in a jar, let us say, leave them for a while, they reach a stage, they start becoming fizzy, and they form a kind of form on the top. At this stage, it's intoxicating. It's intoxicating at this stage. If you drink it, that's haram. If you leave it on its own, without doing anything to it, then it settles. When it settles, it becomes what? It becomes vinegar. It has sour taste then. It becomes vinegar, then you can consume it. So if you leave it on its own to go into the process of fermentation, natural process of fermentation, it goes from juice, normal juice, not only grapes, could be dates even, it could, would go into that process. Apple, apple juice, anything like this. Leave it, it goes into a process where it reaches a stage, it starts fizzing. At that stage, when it's in that stage, it's intoxicating. That's called alcohol. You cannot drink it. Leave it on its own, it will settle down. After it settles down, it becomes sour, it becomes vinegar. Now in the market, you might see white vinegar, or they call it red wine vinegar, or white wine vinegar, and so on. It's vinegar. That's not intoxicating substance. It's vinegar, but could be made from either black grapes or white grapes. Red or white. So it, when it goes into that process of becoming wine, khamr, at that stage you are not able to uh, consume it because it's khamr. When it settles down, it becomes vinegar, then you can drink it. The Prophet wasallam used to put dates in water. At that time, they didn't have the kinds of cordial that you may have or the drinks as available these days. So in order to have a kind of drink that is a bit sweet, they used to put dates in water. So the Prophet ﷺ would drink from it for a couple of days, up to three days, and he would stay away from it because in hot countries, that process could be faster. So it would reach a stage where it starts fizzing, and at that stage, it becomes intoxicating. So to consume any intoxicating drink, that is forbidden, that is classified from the sins of the abdomen. So one has to learn about this matter. You might have any kind of juice, you leave it for a while. If you see that it's making that sound and it's fizzing, stay away from it. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu used to say, stay away from every drink that is fizzing, that is making that noise and it's causing uh, this state. So stay away from it. If it settles, it becomes vinegar, then you can consume it. Also, to consume whatever is a non-liquid but intoxicating substance. That is forbidden as well. Not only the drink that is liquid, sometimes you might have intoxicating substances, but they are solid. 
you are not allowed to consume them. Also, uh, you are not allowed to take any kind of drugs that will alter the state of mind as well. It causes ecstasy as well. It causes like an effect in the eyes and the, the limbs. Those drugs people take, when they take them, they can feel the effect of this drugs, let us say, in their eyes and uh, in the limbs of the body, the tip of the limbs of the bodies. So these kinds of drugs are forbidden as well. That would include the marijuana and uh, hashish, they call it hashish in English, and uh, maybe the ecstasy pills, the ice, all these kinds, they, uh, heroin, cocaine, all these kinds are forbidden. They go under the forbidden substances from being consumed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith Naha an kulli muskir wa muftir Naha an kulli muskir forbade one from taking, consuming any intoxicating substance and from consuming any substance that would cause effect to the eyes and the tips of the limbs of one's body and that goes under drugs. Those are drugs. However, you know, there are uh, some drugs that are used for medication, like the morphine, for instance, in hospitals, they give him a dose for medical purposes, that's exempted. That's exempted. Also, to consume nauseous, filthy substance such as blood or pork, for instance, in some parts of Europe, they extract the blood from animals and they freeze them and they put them in packs. Then they sell them in supermarkets. It's actually frozen blood. That blood that comes out of slaughtered animals, even when you slaughter a sheep, sheep is edible Islamically. When you slaughter it, this blood that is gushing out, is forbidden to be consumed. And that was forbidden in all Shari'as, meaning from Adam till the Sharia of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, consuming pork, consuming improperly slaughtered edible animal, the meat of them is forbidden. That's in all Shari'as. And consuming the running blood that comes out of the animal, that is upon slaughtering, that is forbidden in all Shari'as. It was not allowed in any time of any prophet. It's forbidden. There are certain matters that have never been allowed in any Sharia from the time of Adam till the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these are some examples. Uh, the unjust killing never been allowed, uh, committing fornication and adultery, never been allowed. There was no prophet who drank alcohol. There was no prophet who encouraged people to drink alcohol because consuming the alcohol will make one lose his mind. He reaches a stage where it affects his mind and he won't be able to make uh, proper decisions. And the prophets wouldn't guide people to do something that would be damaging to them physically or socially. That's why no prophet from the time of Adam up to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, no prophet allowed consuming alcohol or encouraged people to drink alcohol. Prophet Isa alayhi salam never drank alcohol. He did not say, as some people fabricate, billah, a little bit of alcohol will make the heart happy. So just be warned, this never happened. No prophet drank alcohol. No prophet encouraged people to drink alcohol. Also to consume what is revolting Although it's not najis, 
such as the mucus that comes out of the nose, it's not nauseous, but it's revolting. The rotted sweat is not nauseous, but it's revolting. One is not allowed to uh, drink what is revolting, even if it is not nauseous. The saliva, after spitting it out, when a person spits out the saliva and they accumulate in a place, now since they separated from his mouth, from his tongue, now they are classified as revolting. He is not allowed to eat them. But as long as one has his saliva inside his mouth, he can swallow them. That does not affect even his fasting. You know, some people may think that if one is fasting, is not allowed to swallow his own saliva. As long as your saliva is pure, unchanged with food or cordial and the like, you can swallow it when you are fasting. Now, uh, you can swallow your saliva as long as it's inside your mouth. But uh, when a person spits the saliva out, it becomes revolting. He is not allowed to swallow it. That's the accumulation of saliva. The wetness is forgiven, is pardoned, the wetness. Like no accumulation, it's just wet, wetness. You see wetness of saliva. Like for instance, when you have a spoon and you are feeding your child. So you put the spoon into his mouth. When you take it out, there is no accumulation of saliva on it, but the wetness of the saliva is on it. So if you put it in your mouth, that's fine. That's not forbidden. That's the wetness is pardoned. So it's not accumulated. Same when you are fasting, for instance, and you lick your lips. Now when you lick your lips, now you can see the trace of the wetness on your lips. So if you lick your lips again, that does not affect your fast because there is no accumulation of saliva on your lips. Also, to unrightfully consume the money of the orphan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran threatened the one who consumed the money of the orphans unjustly with a severe torture in hellfire on the day of judgment. Allah mentioned the verse that means those who consume the money of the orphans unjustly will consume fire in their stomachs on the day of judgment, meaning in hellfire. Because the orphan, Islamically, is the one whose father passed away and he is under puberty. That's the orphan. So if you are 30, 40, 50, and your father passed away, you don't say, I'm an orphan. The orphan is the one who is under puberty and his father passed away. That's the orphan. Usually he's weak. A person may take advantage of the weakness of this child because he doesn't have a father, doesn't have a supporter. So he might take that advantage and take his money, consume his money unjustly, then he falls into that major sin. Also to consume the money of the waqf in a way contrary to the conditions set by the one who established it. There is something in our religion that is called waqf, meaning you dedicate something for others to benefit from. You might, let us say, dig a well, dig a well, and you say, I want to dedicate this well for people to drink from. So he put a condition that I want this well dedicated for people to drink from. Then one is not allowed to wash his car with that water from the well. Why it is dedicated for that purpose? Also, someone might dedicate water to a mosque. In our country, they might have big containers on the roof because water is not 24 hours. 
So a person may bring water, buy water, and fill that container so people can make wudu inside the mosque. He might say, I dedicate this water for people to make wudu from. So it's dedicated for that purpose. One is not allowed to wash his clothes with a... So he needs to observe the conditions established by the one who made that waqf. That's called waqf, dedication. So there is restriction. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Al-Muslimuna عند شروطهم Al-Muslimuna عند شروطهم Meaning, the conditions set by the Muslims who established the waqf must be observed. Must be observed. A person may build a house and he says, this house is dedicated for the knowledge seekers. So those who acquire the knowledge about religion can live in this house, benefit from this house by living in it because they are acquiring the knowledge of the religion. So he dedicated it for that purpose. So one, if he is not a knowledge seeker, is not allowed to stay in that house because it is dedicated for that purpose. A person may dedicate a house for poor people. If one is not poor, cannot live in that house. It's dedicated for poor people and he needs to observe these conditions set by the one who dedicated that house for that purpose. To consume what is given out of shyness. In our religion, one is not allowed to take anything of his brother or sister without the consent. Even if that were to be something that is not valuable. The Prophet ﷺ said, one is not allowed to take the stick of his Muslim brother without his consent without the good intention of that person. Meaning he's given it out of his goodwill. He's not forced. When one, for instance, were to take something from his Muslim brother out of shyness, so he knows it didn't come out of him, out of his goodwill. Like he might see him sitting with other people and say to him, give me that thing. Now if that person were to say no, Others may look at him, oh, your miser, why are you not giving him this matter and the like, this thing. So out of shyness, he might feel shy, embarrassed, so he might give him the item. He took it out of shyness. That is haram. Now we'll talk about the sins of the eye. Among the sins of the eye is for men to look at the faces and hands hands up to the wrists, we're talking here, of marriageable women with desire. So to look at the face and the hands up to the wrists of marriageable women with desire is forbidden. Without desire is not forbidden because the face and the hands of the lady are not part of her prohibited nakedness, are not part of the aura. The face and the hands up to the wrists are not part of the aura. The Prophet ﷺ saw so once the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha, Aisha was his wife, he saw her sister who reached puberty and she wasn't covering properly. The Prophet ﷺ turned away and said to her, O oh Asma, her name was Asma, when a lady reaches puberty, nothing is allowed to be shown of her body except for this and this. And he pointed to the face and the hands. So for instance, we start with the scarf. The scarf they're wearing, uh, in many cases, they don't cover all the hair that is here classified from the head so you see it showing that's number one 
Number two, they might wear a scarf, the head covering, that is see-through. So you can see the ease, you can see the color of the hair, that is not sufficient. It needs to cover the skin color, so no one would be able to distinguish the color of the skin from underneath it. So some scarves are very thin, see-through, so that is not sufficient. Also, some do not cover this part under the chin. Now, up to here, that's the face boundaries. Where the jaws meet, that's called the chin. Up to here, that's the face boundaries. What is underneath, it, now that's from the neck. So, some of them, they wear the scarf, and they put a pin here, and this part is showing, this is by consensus part of the aura. By consensus part of the aura. They need to cover this part, which is classified as part of the neck. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran the obligation of covering the head. Not only mentioned the obligation of covering the head, also, Allah instructed women how to, how to wear that head covering. Because some ladies in the past used to put the head covering and let it down without covering the neck. Allah Ta'ala said, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ This is called al jayb this opening here at the neck, that's called al-jayb. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ Meaning when they wear the headscarf, the right edge of it, they take it to the left side, and the left edge of it will take it to the right side. By, this, by doing this, they cover this part here. Because that's part of the neck, and the upper part of the chest is part of the aura they need to cover it. By consensus, the face of the woman and her hands are not part of the aura, the prohibited nakedness. Al-Qadu Iyad, radiyallahu anhu, in his book, Al-Shifa, said, a lady is allowed by consensus to uncover the face, and men are the ones who are requested to lower their gaze. Meaning, if one were to look at her face with desire, he is sinful. But she is not sinful for uncovering the face. Now, if they were to say, some people say, yeah, there are some uh, bad guys out there. So, why don't we force or oblige women to cover the face? Now, those sick people, even if she is fully covered and the intention is corrupted, they will still look at her in a bad way. She is not obligated to cover the face and the hands because this is not part of the aura. Men are the ones who are asked to lower their gaze. And this is confirmed in the hadith narrated by al-Bukhari and uh, Imam Ahmad and others that on the morning of Eid during the season of Hajj on the morning of the day of Eid the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had his cousin Al-Fadl Ibn Al-Abbas Al-Abbas was the uncle of the Prophet he had a son called Al-Fadl that's the brother of Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Abbas. This is Al-Fadl ibn Al-Abbas. Al-Fadl was behind the Prophet. He was handsome. He was very handsome. He was with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on his camel behind him. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was approached by a beautiful lady, young lady, who came to ask the Prophet about a matter pertaining to Hajj. And she was telling him, my father has not performed Hajj. However, he is now very old. He reached 
an age where he cannot even sit on the camel, he will fall. So he won't be able to perform Hajj. Can I perform Hajj on his behalf? And the Prophet wasallam said, yes, and you'll be rewarded for that good intention to do it on behalf of your father. You'll be rewarded. Now, by the time she was asking the Prophet, and he was replying, he realized that she was looking at his cousin Al-Fadl, staring at him. And he was staring at her. So he realized that that look was not an innocent look. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He turned the head of his cousin to the other side. Al-Abbas later, his father, asked the Prophet ﷺ, why did you turn the head of your cousin Al-Fadl? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw a young man and a young woman and I feared that the devil may intervene between them. So he did not say, what is the proof? That was after the ayah of hijab was revealed to the Prophet because this incident took place nearly 80 days before the death of the Prophet So that's towards the end of his life. That's in the farewell Hajj. So after that, the Prophet didn't live for long. So the ayah, the verses pertaining to covering for ladies was already revealed to the Prophet The proof here is that the Prophet did not say to her, it's haram, go cover your face. Can't you see what you did to my cousin? You seduced him. Go and cover your face. He never said that. Rather, he turned the head of his cousin to the other side. And for me, Al-Qadu Ayyad said, women are allowed to uncover the face and men are requested to lower their gazes. That's the proof regarding this matter. So one is not allowed to look at the face and the hands of marriageable women with desire. But without desire, it is permissible. But to look at other parts of the body, even without desire, is forbidden in that case. So a man is not allowed to look at the hair of a marriageable woman, even without desire. This is part of the aura. This is part of the aura. Let us say she has a short slave. So this part of the hand is part of the aura. Now you see some uh, Muslim ladies who are wearing the scarf, now they are wearing short sleeves. And they think they are making the proper covering. No, it's not the proper covering. Some of them, they wear pants that is short or a skirt that is short. So there is part of the leg that is showing. That's part of the aura. It is also unlawful to look at the unlawful nakedness, that's the auras, for the man and the woman, even if it was among the people of the same gender, such as for a man to look at what is between the navel and the knees of another man. So that's same gender. But the area between the navel and the knee for a man, that's aura. So for a man to look at another man at the area between the navel and the knee, that's haram. This is part of the aura. And for a woman to look at another woman at the area between the navel and the knee, that is also forbidden. So the aura of a lady in front of another Muslim lady is the area between the navel and the knees. So this needs to be covered. So men in front of men between navel and knees, a woman in front of women between navel and knees as well. And the aura of a non-marriageable lady, non-marriageable lady, in front of her mahram, like her son, 
her brother is the area between the navel and the knees as well. Some scholars added that top part of the chest as well. But uh, other than that, it's not part of the aura. Also, the man and the woman are not allowed to uncover the aura. For the man, we're talking about the private parts. And for uh, ladies, between uh, the navel and the knees. In private, if there is no need. Like for one, even if he's sitting by himself at home, he is not allowed to walk naked in the house because there is no need. But in some, let us say, countries, if it's very hot and for the sake of cooling down, he uncovered this area, he is allowed. Another need, he wants to put medicine, let us say, in the private area. So he needs to uncover it. That's a need. He needs to have shower. So he uncovers that area. That's a need. It's not haram in these cases. But if there is no need uh, for him and for her, for a man and a woman, they are not allowed to uncover the aura in private needlessly. Also, it is unlawful to look down on a Muslim because he's poor, for example. And to look into someone else's house without one's permission, like those who look from the hall of the door, for instance. Or they try to come near the window, try to hear what they're saying, and they don't like people to listen to them. And also it's not permissible to look at something one kept hidden if they don't like for others to look at it. So they have something, they don't want others to look at them, so you know, are not allowed to go and look at them without their permission. There are some people, subhanAllah, these days, if they visit you, they greet you at the door, they go inside and they go into the rooms. Where are you going? Yeah, she's her friend. Yeah, still, maybe she doesn't want you to go into her room. They don't think of all these matters. Okay, you, you want to walk? Even there are adab, you know, adab, manners. So if you go to someone, knock on the door, there is a way in Islam how to stand. So you do not face him like this. He opens the door and he sees your face. And you do not turn your back to him. You stand sideways. Lower your head. When they open, say, Assalamu alaikum. When they say, come in, you go inside. You don't just walk in. Maybe he doesn't want you to come in at this time. But some people do not observe all these matters, subhanAllah. It's very important that we train ourselves to be what? To have good manners. To have good manners. Look at the Prophet wasallam. He never extended his leg in the presence of a guest. When someone comes to him from his companions or someone is coming to him, he would not extend his leg in front of him. That's the Prophet wasallam. If someone were to ask him, about something, he would turn by his whole body towards him. That's from the manners. Not like he's talking to you and you are not giving him any attention. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, I can hear you. Say what you want. These days, sometimes, when you find some children, when their parents talk to them, they don't look at their parents. This is uh, from the ill manners. Your parents are talking to you. Come to your parents with politeness. Put your head down. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. This is how you should be. Teach them. When they come inside the house, it's good to teach them 
that they come straight away to you and kiss your hands. Let them get used to this. They go inside, they say, Assalamu alaikum, they kiss your hands. Do you want any help? You make dua for them. It's enough for you when your parents make dua for you. May Allah make you amongst those who are accepted by Allah. What a great dua to hear it from your father or from your mother. Instead of hearing your mother or your father making dua, that Allah will destroy you because you're causing distress to your parents. I had one parent coming to me once, father, subhanAllah, he was crying. And he said to me, I had to call the police so they can take my son out of the house. How heartbreaking is it? He's calling the police so they can drag his son out of the house. He doesn't want his son because he's on drugs, he's very bad, he's whatever, whatever, whatever. He reached that stage. He cannot handle his own son. And when he was a little kid, he used to carry him, change his nappy, and take care of him, feed him, put him on his shoulders, walk with him. When he cries at night, he might carry him just to settle him down so he can rest. Look after a while what he is getting from his children. It's very heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking. Some ladies these days, when the young ones, when they talk to their mothers, as if they're talking to not even friends, because they respect their friends more than their mothers. <coughs> and all what they do, they ask for things. Mom, don't forget, buy me such and such. If she comes back from school, and she finds out that her mother did not get her what she wanted, she starts screaming. So sad. They are not servants for you. You come back from school, tell them if they need any help, start helping your parents. This is how you should behave. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the good manners. We ask Allah as he beautified our look to beautify our manners as well. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to end our life as righteous Muslims. Ameen. And Allah knows best. We say la ilaha illallah and make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.